Okay, go to let me know if you can hear me okay. I'm like, good, well, welcome. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Excited to speak at Baker Bookhouse and to have all of you here listening. My friends are here, which is so fun. So many of my writer friends are here listening from Utah, right along with me. So thanks for coming. I'm Michaela, and I am the author of Ordinary and Purpose. Um, I'm on social media at that same uh, name if you want to find me there. So I thought tonight I would talk a little bit about why ordinary, and then I'll read to you just a little bit um, from the book as well. Okay? So, and save some questions for me for the end. Um, so, why ordinary? Um, it's kind of a different term, I think. I think we hear a lot about simple living, but I chose ordinary. On purpose. Um, I used to think I wanted a perfect life. I thought I needed a perfect life. I think I was trying to drown out the little voice in the back of my head that was kind of always whispering, there's something wrong with you. And I thought maybe if I pushed hard enough and I tried hard enough and I arranged the pieces just so I could maybe prove that voice wrong. So I spent a lot of time striving, a lot of years striving, trying to line up the perfect marriage and the perfect family and the perfect career and the perfect life. And then somewhere in the middle of all that striving, uh, my marriage broke under the weight of my husband's drug addiction. And I started drowning in my work as a family practice doctor and in young motherhood. I had two young boys at the time and in life in general. And I just realized I'd been chasing the wrong thing all along. And perfect is pretend. And what I really wanted was just a regular life. I wanted like yard work and home depot on Saturday. And I didn't want to be caught up in the chase anymore. So it was right around the time that my husband was coming out with his second stay in rehab um, that I met this young woman in my office. I began working just three days a week around that time also. And her name was Kendra. She was a lot like me. She was we were right around the same age. She had a brand new baby, a couple months old. She was nursing him. And I sort of hit it off with her right away as a friend. But the problem is that Kendra really couldn't breathe. She was having a lot of difficulty catching her breath, couldn't lay flat at night, um, just came in as a new patient looking for some help. And it was really quickly that I noticed her blood pressure was through the roof and her EKG in the clinic was abnormal. And so I sent her straight away to the hospital to be admitted and evaluated. And that night, as she was getting her echocardiogram or tracing of her heart, she decompensated and had to have CPR resuscitation and ended up in the ICU for weeks um, of time. So that was the beginning of my caring for her for months and then years of time. So it turned out for Kendra, she had what's called an acute cardiomyopathy, which means her heart just doesn't pump correctly anymore. And she was a kidney failure. So she went on dialysis and she was just kind of having a multi-organ system shut down. And so she really quickly became a very complicated patient. And she ended up with a cardiologist and a nephrologist and an intensive care doctor and a rheumatologist. And my job as her family practice doctor was just to help her navigate that system and kind of navigate specialists and tests and things. And my other job was to be her cheerleader because as she started to improve, we really did celebrate together. And she came off of dialysis and she was able to come off of a lot of her medications. And we were just thrilled that she was getting back to a more normal life. And then one day when I was in clinic, I got a phone call from the neighboring hospital that Kendra had had a stroke. And it was just a really large dual hemisphere, meaning both sides of the brain, hemorrhagic stroke, meaning she had a really big brain bleed. And I remember hearing that news and then just going into my office and closing the door and sitting at my desk and just crying because I knew how devastating this injury would be for her. And I knew it was, if she survived it, just the kind of injury that you don't recover from. 
and, and it was. It was a never gonna walk again, never gonna talk again kind of injury. And so I left work that day. I went to pick up my kiddos from the babysitter and got them home to make dinner. And it was kind of the time of night when everyone's very tired and everyone's really hungry and everybody's junk is everywhere in the kitchen and, you know, kind of that witching hour of night. And I just remember looking around at sort of my chaotic, ordinary life and thinking, Kendra will never get to do this. She will never have one more ordinary day. And I... I also was just so aware that I was standing in line, how just a year prior, um, I had wanted an ordinary life so much, and I was in the middle of chaos with my husband and with work, and, and my life was sort of crumbling, and then I had a second chance, and I had a very ordinary life. And I think that's when I really realized what a gift that is, how then, the diagnosis comes, or the marriage ends, or you lose someone, perfect just goes right out the window. And what people say time and again is that they just want one more ordinary day. They want Saturday morning pancakes. So um, Kendra did live for several more years. She was wheelchair bound. She was nonverbal and um, then passed away probably three or four years after that, I had moved to Utah, so I wasn't caring for her at that time, but included a chapter in the book about her because she made such a big impact on my life, and I did get to use her real name, so I did reach out to her husband just to make sure that I could include her in tribute in the book. So I wanted to read just a couple of paragraphs um, toward the end of the chapter about Kendra, and the chapter name is For Her. The truth is, I think of Kendra often. At dinner time, while my family gives their high low of the day, every time I came home from the hospital with a new baby, whenever I kissed the tops of our little boys' heads on their first day of school, or special holidays, or birthdays, as we all sing happy birthday around our warm kitchen table. Random Tuesday afternoons, pushing my kids on the swings, nights of frustration, trying to get everyone to just go to bed already. Kendra's name slips into my brain right in the middle of an ordinary moment, and I remember. Kendra won't ever be able to do this. She'll never make a meal plan for the week, then traverse the aisles of the grocery store, lug all the bags to the car, and eventually pack it along the pantry shelves at home. She'll never move loads of superhero undies and stray socks and smelly basketball jerseys from the washer to the dryer to the ever-growing pile of weight to be folded. She'll never wait in the car pickup line and smile as kids run from school and little arms throw open the door, and she'll never explain, hey, how was your day, as they climb in. She'll never stand cooking a giant pot of dinner at the stove while listening to every, hey, mom, guess what, or overseeing first grade math homework. She'll never drive kids back and forth to basketball or soccer practice or cheer from the stands for her boy on Saturday. She'll never have another bedtime with baths and that sweet-smelling baby lotion and books and snuggling next to her boy as she inhales the sweet scent all his own. Her life was cut short so unexpectedly, so abruptly, and she'll never have another lovely, messy, hard, wonderful, absolutely ordinary day. She'll never get that chance. Sometimes, right in the middle of my own ordinary life, the thought of her reminds me to savor every moment to be present and soak it in, even the hard, messy, mundane parts. She reminds me to notice and breathe and listen and touch and taste all of it, this life. She reminds me to really live it. She reminds me life happens in the ordinary. What a gift. Kendra was just like me, a mom, and she still helps me way more than I ever helped her. Now she is gone, and I am healing. It was really fun to um, 
send this chapter to her husband before the book came out. I uh, he had to sign like a little waiver saying I could use her name, so I did get to send the chapter early, and that was really special. He uh, has moved on and he's remarried. He was, um, her son is really close to my Eli's age. He's just a little bit younger than my son, who's 14. And then they have two little girls. So, yeah, it's been neat to kind of still be in contact with him and see that part. Well, thank you so much for coming, you guys. We appreciate you coming. And I will be back at that little table there if you'd like me to sign it up or you put up with any questions that you don't want to ask. I'm bringing the group. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.